Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. Dr. Olzdaga is enjoying some well-deserved time off this week and will return next week. We don't have any specific updates this morning as we want to leave plenty of time for our three speakers. A quick note about upcoming Grand Rounds, we will have Dr. Steve Cummings, Professor Emeritus at UCSF, followed by our own Dr. Ewan Ashley. Right, to get back to you, to get back to today, as you all know, <clears throat> pardon me, in 2020, Dr. Harrington established the Department of Medicine Chair Diversity Investigator Awards. The goal of these awards was to support research that addresses health inequity, social determinants of health, cultural competence, outcomes improvement, health system access and utilization for racial, ethnic, and sexual and gender minorities, among many other possibilities. We will be announcing the recipients of this year's awards in the upcoming weeks, but today I'm thrilled that we will have two of the awards inaugural recipients sharing their amazing research with us, along with a fellow that is involved in one of the projects. I will introduce all three of our speakers who will present their findings and then we will have time for questions at the end. As a reminder, please put your questions in the Q&A and upvote the questions to bring them to the top of the field. With that, I will get to our amazing speakers. First. Dr. Fatima Rodriguez is an assistant professor in cardiovascular medicine and by courtesy, Stanford Prevention Research Center. She received her MD and MPH from Harvard University and completed residency in internal medicine at the Brigham and, Will Wait, excuse me, Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Rodriguez came west to Stanford where she completed a cardiovascular medicine fellowship and served as chief fellow. She specializes in the primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, lipid disorders, and cardiovascular risk assessment in high-risk populations. Dr. Rodriguez's research includes a range of topics relating to racial, ethnic, and gender disparities in cardiovascular disease prevention and developing novel interventions to address disparities. Her research has been featured in numerous journals, and she has given talks and presentations both nationally and internationally. She was recently the the recipient of the incredibly prestigious Douglas P. Zipes Distinguished Young Scientist Award from the American College of Cardiology. And she's won so many awards and has so many honors that we'd be here all day if I were just to read through them. Her project is entitled Reasons for Statin Non-Use in Multi-Ethnic Populations with Cardiovascular Disease. Next, we've got Dr. Suchi Anand. She is an assistant professor in the Division of Nephrology and director of the Center for Tubular Tubulo interstitial kidney disease at Stanford. She received her medical degree from Wash U in, in St. Louis and completed her internal medicine training at Brigham and Williams Hospital in Boston. She completed her master's in clinical epidemiology and nephrology fellowship at Stanford. Dr. Anand is engaged in clinical research aimed at advancing the care of patients with kidney disease living in low resource settings using practical tools. She has active projects in collaboration with University of Utah to promote exercise programming for underserved populations, with the Center for Chronic Disease Control in India to study risk factors for kidney disease in South Asians, and with Kandy Hospital in Sri Lanka to investigate chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology affecting agricultural communities. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Anand also participated in partnership to elucidate seroepidemiology, vaccine acceptance, and response to vaccination among patients on dialysis. She is part of two NIH consortia focused on improving the health of underserved populations. Dr. Anand has authored numerous book chapters and peer-reviewed articles in high-impact journals and received the McCormick Gabilon Women in Medicine Faculty Award in 2020, among many others. Her project is entitled, End Stage Kidney Disease in California's Central Valley. And finally, we have Dr. Marimar Contreras Nieves. She was born and raised in Puerto Rico. She completed her bachelor's degree in cellular and molecular biology at the University of Puerto Rico. That was at the Rio Piedras campus and obtained her MD at the University of Puerto Rico School of Medicine. She completed her residency in internal medicine at Stanford in June of 2022 and is now a first year nephrology fellow here at Stanford. Dr. Nieves has a strong interest in studying diverse populations and ways to reduce disparities among minoritized populations. She started working with Dr. Anand in 2020 on the project CKDU in California Central Valley. And with that, I will hand it over to our speakers. Thanks so much. Dr. Rodriguez. Great, I'll share my screen.
Am I sharing the correct screen, team? Yes, you are. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to present an update on our ongoing work for reasons for static non-use in multi-ethnic populations that have cardiovascular disease within our healthcare system. I'll note that the announcement for this presentation said something about Stalin, and this presentation will not talk about Stalin at all. Something less controversial, hopefully about statin use. These are my disclosures. And this is an outline of what we'll cover today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about the background and the importance of statins, which hopefully just to remind everyone, especially in secondary prevention, some project updates, future directions, and importantly, lessons learned from this award. By way of background, we know that statins are the cornerstone for the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. In secondary prevention, which is what this project is focused on, there's really no controversy that statins save lives and reduce cardiovascular events. Five years after an, a myocardial infarction, you only need to treat 30 patients with a statin to prevent one cardiovascular death, and this has been shown in numerous studies as shown here. Statin therapy reduces the risk of major vascular events by about 25% for each millimole per liter, or the way we measure it, 30 milligrams per deciliter, reduction in LDL cholesterol. And statins really reduce the risk with greatest absolute benefits with those as greater baseline risk. And again, numerous studies have shown that the lower the LDL with statins and other therapies, the better. Yet our patients don't take statins and our clinicians often fail to prescribe statins when indicated. So what is the problem of statin non-adherence? We know that less than 50% of patients after a myocardial infarction are taking a statin a year later. And registries show that after two years, the persistence of statins drops below 30%. And something that our group is very interested in is that there are pronounced disparities by race, ethnicity, gender, age, insurance, and even site of care about who's getting guideline-directed statin therapy. We've previously shown with data from the VA with over 500,000 patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or ASCVD, which includes patients that have coronary disease, that have peripheral arterial disease, cerebrovascular disease, that there's a dose-response relationship between medication adherence as measured by NPR and survival, even among a group of patients that's fairly stable, again, followed by our VA system. I thought this accompanying editorial really summarized uh, our findings well. Statins work, but only in people who take them. And even small deviations from the ideal adherence level can have pronounced impacts on survival. Equally important, again, even in the VA, we found there was persistence disparities in adherence, persistent disparities in outcomes, where women, older and younger adults, racial and ethnic minoritized groups were less likely to be adherent to statins, and were also less likely to take guideline-directed high-intensity statins. So what are our patients saying? We've partnered with the National Minority Health Alliance, which is a large nonprofit organization, to try to understand diverse patients and providers' understanding of why patients may be hesitant to take lipid-lowering therapy. And some of the, the best data I have is from these patient focus groups. And again, patients have said things like, if I knew what cholesterol did, I might pay more attention to it. My doctor in Brazil told me cholesterol was good for my body and I don't need the medication, but I came here and they said it was bad. Who should I believe? We're changing guidelines. We're changing posts. I didn't know you could take a medication for cholesterol. I didn't know it was serious. I know heart disease runs in my family. A recent publication by Nelson and colleagues um, in Jack. Uh, earlier this year showed that, again, even in a highly insured population, there remains a huge gap in guideline-directed high-intensity statin therapy, and only half of patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease are taking any statin at all, and fewer are taking a high-intensity statin. And again, there are disparities where women, older adults, those that have non-coronary diseases or primary vascular bed involvement, and those that have more comorbidities are less likely to be uh, prescribed in taking statin therapy. And again, another poignant accompanying editorial to this paper really calling for divine intervention to try to improve rates of guideline concordance statin therapy in those that are needed. So with that background, the way our group uh, thinks about statin non-use is really trying to break it down into factors that are potentially actionable. 
there are patient factors, there are clinician factors, and there are system factors. And to try to understand and capture these barriers and potentially identify solutions, we may need to rely on separate data. Something that we'll talk about at the end is that patients may not use medical data, again, to try to get their understanding of health um, factors such as statin use. They may rely on social media. They may rely on, on other factors. And again, how clinicians uh, document statin use in our system is important and how our system has that as a quality metric is also important and may affect statin use. So now I'll turn it over to our specific study question. So like many questions and important questions of preventive cardiology, the genesis of this project really st started with a simple question by a leader in prevention and in clinical research, Dr. David Marin, who many of you know. In our weekly prevention meetings, he asked a very simple question. What proportion of our patients are taking statins? To which I replied a simple answer of, I don't know. And this really led to this important project, which again is trying to, within our healthcare system, understand First, what are the proportion and predictors of guideline-directed statin use in secondary prevention patients across our healthcare system? We hypothesized that all of our patients would be on guideline-directed statin therapy, but in reality, we knew that the data um, has shown otherwise, so we assumed that, that many would not be on at least a high-intensity statin, and that there would be a disparities by patient characteristics. But we wanted to also look at what are the potential documented reasons in our healthcare system for patients that are not taking guideline-directed status. And we hypothesize that muscle-based side effects or intolerances and allergies may be the primary reasons cited within the electronic health records for statin non-use, and again, that these would vary by patient characteristics. But I will say that the best and most important part of this project was this, this partnership uh, between cardiology, data, data science, biomedical informatics. And this work is really led by Dr. Ashish Saraju uh, from my group and Dr. Jean Coquette from Tina Hernandez Bussard's group with really trying to use the rich repository of data available in our electronic health records to answer these questions. Again, to summarize, for patients that have clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the latest guidelines and really multi-society guidelines have recommended with a class one level of evidence that everyone should be on statins and most people should be on high intensity statins. And this is importantly, irrespective of the baseline LDL levels. We know that statins reduce LDL, but they're also considered a risk redu reducers themselves. So again, all patients with diagnosed ASCVD are strongly recommended statin therapy. So this was our population cohort. We started with 92,000 patients with ASCVD between January 2014 uh, and July 2019. And again, this was really when the cholesterol guidelines recommended that everyone um, just take a, a statin, particularly a high intensity statin, if they have ASCVD. We excluded those that were younger or older uh, for privacy reasons. To make sure we allowed for adequate documentation of statin use in the EHR, we required that these uh, patients had two separate encounters um, in the Stanford Healthcare Alliance system, and that's just a breakdown of where these patients are coming from. Most are from SHC, also from UHA and Valley Care is shown there. Um, a little over half of the patients have coronary artery disease as their primary ASCVD diagnosis, but we see um, that a fair amount, about 22%, have cerebrovascular disease, 11% PAD, and 18% have polyvascular disease, meaning one or more of these diagnoses. And this is the main finding. So this is to answer Dr. Marin's initial question. So we found that 60, by, just based on the discrete data from the EHR, there were 60% of these patients with two ASCVD diagnosis in our electronic health records were taking a statin as documented in the discrete data available in our electronic health record. So pretty similar to contemporary uh, practice. But now we want to dig a little further and really understand who these patients are and try to understand the reasons why these patients may not be on statins. So of those patients who were prescribed statins with ASCVD, only one in four were taking a high intensity statin. And if we dig a little bit further into the baseline characteristics of who are the patients that are missing a statin prescription in the electronic health record, in general, these patients tend to be a little bit younger. They tended to be of minoritized racial ethnic groups, uh, get their care at community health centers and uh, have non-coronary artery disease, so other vascular bed uh, ASCVD, and suggesting that the patients 
that were prescribed statins were taking them, we see that the baseline LDLs were uh, lower for those that were ha had statins as opposed to those who were not prescribed statins. We then hypothesize that many of these patients that were not prescribed statins, again, people are coding ASCVD diagnosis, would have an allergy or an intolerance as a potential explanation of why they were not on statins. But in actuality, we found that only 3.5% of these patients without a statin prescription had anything documented, again, in the discrete field of the EHR, so really a minority of the patients. And then among those patients that did not have an allergy documented, and again, were not prescribed a statin based on the discrete fields, we found in the use of clinical notes that about 4,000 of them had mentions of statins in their clinical notes, and that would be the basis for our deep learning data set. Just to take a little detour, a quick primer on supervised machine learning, um, which is the method that we use to study the, the EHR unstructured text, um, for supervised machine learning, we provide the models with label data. So in this case, we're labeling statin use, we're labeling reasons for statin non-use. We train the model on a subset of that data and then give it new test data to try to predict um, statin use, statin non-use, and the reasons for non-use as I'll review. For this uh, project, we used a, a, a model called Clinical BERT, which is a deep learning-based natural language processing model. It's a contemporary benchmark approach. And its accuracy is enhanced by transfer learning, meaning that it's already been trained on a large volume of clinical notes and EHR data, actually from ICUs in uh, Boston. So of the 4,000 patients that had clinical notes mentioned, we considered notes uh, from a 30-day period after the index ASCVD diagnosis to allow time for documentation. We randomly selected a sample of these, uh, these notes for manual annotation. So again, we're labeling the notes. And we asked first the binary question, is statin use documented in the free text, yes or no? And then after that, we asked, okay, if it's, if it's documented, is there, if there is no documentation of statin use, is there a reason explained for statin non-use? We then trained models specifically on this. And the reasons for statin non-use that we um, got from reviewing these clinical notes were some of it was based on muscle side effects, but there was a lot of comments on GI side effects, cognitive side effects, lipid values, which is a guideline discord in practice, meaning the LDL is at goal or no need to do this. Patient preference came up. And again, the concept of therapeutic inertia, where somebody may defer to a different clinician or they may defer to a different visit and discussing other things in the clinical visit. We then took the full cohort um, to test the performance of this models, again, for the binary task of statin yes, no, and then the multi-class predictive model for reasons for statin non-use. So one key finding is that of some of these patients that we said they did not have statin prescriptions, there was actually mention of statin use in their clinical notes, meaning um, we just didn't do a good job documenting their statin prescriptions in the medication fields. In terms of the reasons for statin non-use, we hypothesized that muscle-based side effects would predominate, but we can actually see that many other reasons um, came in first. For example, other side effects, a lot of comments on GI side effects, memory side effects, uh, perceived lipid control, which again, uh, guideline discord in practice. And this was much more common among Hispanic and Asian uh, patients where their clinician would say their LDL is 100, so it's okay, or they had a stroke, um, LDL is okay. Uh, which again is not what the guidelines say. Patient preference and, and therapeutic inertia, and I'll show you some examples. This is the performance of the models, and we see there's a, a good per, uh, performance for the binary classification task as well as the multi-label classification task. And again, this is just some quotes from, from the notes of what, what kind of things we were able to extract. Intolerant of low-dose statins started with high CK, decline statins, patient prefers not to take a statin, intolerant to three different side effects, again, with GI predominant side effects. This came up a lot, the therapeutic inertia, which again is, is, is fairly actionable. Okay, for no statin at this time, discuss it next visit, discuss it next visit. And, and an important one in terms of disparities was the mismatch with practice guidelines with a focus on, let me recheck the lipid panel, let's see how their LDL is doing, no indication for a statin, LDL is well controlled. And again, this was more common um, in minoritized racial and ethnic groups. 
So in summary for the study findings that can be uh, seen in more detail in the paper that was published by these terrific lead authors, uh, Dr. Siraju and Jean Coquette, nearly two in five patients lack chyline-directed statin prescriptions. If we only rely on the discrete fields in REHR, we fail to capture the diversity of reasons for statin non-use. And the reasons for statin non-use vary, and they include patient factors and, again, clinician factors, and concerningly some guideline discordant practices. Women, patients with non-coronary vascular bed disease, so stroke, PAD, were less likely to receive any statin prescriptions, and many times this was justified in the electronic health records. There's a lot of future directions from this work. Um, this was actually just accepted as an abstract to the American Heart Association, work uh, led by our medical res resident, Celeste Whitting, and our postdoctoral fellow from the CDH, Zara Assisi, trying to really dig into some of the gender disparities in statin use among patients with ASCBD in our healthcare system. We're also expanding to other high-risk populations that have a class one indication for statin uh, use. So now we are looking at diabetes patients and uh, high-risk primary prevention patients as, as calculated by the pool cohort equation. And this is work again being led by Dr. Saraju, Dr. Alban, and Zara Sisi. We also uh, have uh, created a pipeline for doing this for other evidence-based therapies. So Zara Zizi, one of our postdoctoral fellows, is again really interested in, in uh, disparities in anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation. Dr. Alex Sandu is very interested in guideline-directed care in heart failure, so we'll be looking at similar approaches. And of course, um, this is all Stanford data, so we're externally validating and hoping to do this um, at Houston Methodist and through our partners through the National Minority Health Alliance. Our group is also interested in looking at data outside of the healthcare system, and we know our patients often use this data to make their medical decisions. So in another uh, beautiful uh, data science cardiology partnership, we have our outstanding medical resident, Dr. Suleiman Samani, and PhD student, Marika Van Bushen for doc from Dr. Hernandez Bussard's lab, looking at Reddit and trying to understand public opinions around statin use. And there's a lot of posts are, are about statins, and that has really increased exponentially in the past decade. And you can really uh, spend a long time on Reddit looking at some of these very interesting posts. There's a lot of talk about the ketogenic diet and statins, um, the dangers of statins, and really trying to get uh, opinions about taking statins. Should I trust my doctor? Should I not trust my doctor? Side effects. And we're using unsupervised machine learning techniques to try to identify clusters of some of the reasons, again, uh, for statin non-use. And there's a few very interesting emerging topics, again, with the issue around keto diets and LDL, um, people concerned about stem cells and statins, some association with COVID misinformation and statins. So more to come. And finally, I just wanted to end with a few lessons learned from this project. First, statins are underused even in the highest risk patient groups, even in our healthcare system. The unstructured text in the EHR can reveal novel insights into potentially actionable reasons for statin non-use. A deep learning-based NLP approach can be scaled to other evidence-based therapies, and we're working on that next. And this is really a take-home point and a highlight of this award experience for me is that team science is better science. Um, the partnership with the hernandez Bussar lab has just been wonderful, and we've been able to really pair um, individuals with complementary skills to answer important questions in preventive cardiology. I would like to acknowledge my, the wonderful members of my research group, the Heart Lab, and my, my mentor shown below, the Stanford Preventive Cardiology Group, and you can see that Dr. Ashish Saraju is now at Cleveland Clinic, is still part of this group, so once you're in the group, you're never out and the Department of Medicine um, and the, for this uh, diversity chair awards, funding sources and my little ones. And he always looks like that. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Rodriguez. That was fantastic. And I will turn it over to Dr. Anand now. All right, can you guys see my screen? Not yet. Ah, okay. Great. All right, wonderful. 
I thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here to be able to discuss our Department of Medicine sponsored work on end stage kidney disease in California Central Valley. And as you heard, my co-presenter today is Dr. Contreras Nevis, who is a thriving and brilliant cardio uh, not cardiology, nephrology fellow in our division. And um, she's really the one who's bringing this work from concept to fruition. I'm going to be giving a little bit of the background and rationale for the, for the work. And Dr. Contreras Nevis will describe the pilot, which we recently launched after COVID-19 um, restrictions were relaxed. We have no relevant disclosures. So this is a picture from the sugarcane fields in Nicaragua. And the sugarcane fields in Nicaragua have recently become the epicenter of a kidney disease that is affecting agricultural workers. This was first described in the early 2000s. And it's since then it's become apparent that Kidney disease is a growing cause of death among men in Central America, in El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala. These are the described hotspots in Central America. And similarly, in around the same time, um, kidney disease was recognized as a big problem in Sri Lanka's central province, where rice paddy, rice paddy field farming has been the major occupation. And in fact, about 20% of households living in the central dry regions of Sri Lanka have a person living with them who has kidney disease. So you may have heard about this disease um, on the radio. That's how I first heard about it, or it has been covered widely in the national news media as well. It's termed Mesoamerican nephropathy in the context of Central America, or chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology, or CKDU, in the context of Sri Lanka and the southern coast of India. And it's really been described as an epidemic. It is newsworthy, I believe, because of two reasons. Um, the first is that it really is a medical mystery. We don't know what could be causing kidney disease that's killing agricultural workers who are otherwise healthy and don't have tr traditional risk factors for kidney disease. And the second is that there really is a powerful David versus Goliath dynamic at play in this story. Um, agricultural workers are amongst the most marginalized populations throughout the world. They are vulnerable to many social and economic and environmental stressors. And on the other hand, some of the industries that employ them or supply them, like the uh, sugarcane industry or the uh, agrochemical industry are amongst the most powerful in the world. Um, despite intense um, media coverage, as well as two decades of very heartfelt and passionate um, 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 research, um, we only have a few things at hand about kidney disease of unknown etiology. So the U on CKDU remains firmly in place. So what we know for certain is that um, a in pre prevalence studies, um, men are about twice as likely to be affected compared with women. Farm work does seem to be a risk factor. And the described hotspots are all indeed hot, they are in hot, dry, low-lying regions in the world. And then finally, we have some kidney biopsy data from these affected populations, and the site of injury seems to be the kidney tubules, which is, um, as some of you may know, is a much rarer form of chronic kidney disease than kidney disease affecting the glomerulus. So I think the search for a cause of CKDU remains fairly broad, but at the same time, our field is trying to coalesce around five or six major hypotheses, and I'll describe them briefly here. The first posits that heat stress or strenuous work in hot conditions is leading to recurrent um, acute kidney injury that is then progressing to 
of chronic kidney disease. Um, the evidence for this comes mostly from cross-harvest studies where they have observed decline in kidney function, modest decline in kidney function among people who are doing the most strenuous tasks in a sugar cane field, so cane cutting, for example. A second hypothesis posits that a specific agrochemical or a mixture of agrochemicals is directly nephrotoxic. We don't have good data to support this, but paraquat and glyphosate are the two agrochemicals that are most very widely used and are the most scrutinized in this field right now. So in both settings, in both sugarcane um, farming, as well as in rice paddy farming, there is a practice of slash and burn cultivation, which releases silicon nanoparticles. And there's a group hypothesis, hypothesizing that the silicon nanoparticles are nephrotoxic. There's similarly um, nickel. So th there was a higher bio burden of nickel identified in a small case control study in people who living in Nicaragua. Um, and nickel is enriched in some of the Central um, American soil because of the area's volcanic history. Leptospirosis is a classic example of an infection that affects the kidney tubules. And it's possible that an infection in both regions is causing chronic kidney tubular injury. And then finally, uh, our field is learning more about the genetics of kidney disease. Um, and it's possible that a uh, genetic pre predisposition that alters tubular handling of certain solutes is interacting with the perfect environmental measure or environmental exposure to cause the disease. The look, these are a challenging set of hypotheses to investigate. Clearly, uh, many of them have never been investigated in uh, the setting of kidney disease, certainly never in the populations that we're currently attempting to study. And layered on top of that is the social and um, political unrest that some of you may have heard about in the, in the regions in both Central America and more recently Sri Lanka as well. But on the flip side, I think investigating CKDU is really leading to very high quality international collaborations that are multi-domain, they are multidisciplinary, and um, really lifting the science um, globally in kidney disease investigations. And we're lucky to be part of such an investigation um, in Sri Lanka with Candy Teaching Hospital. What we're doing there is recruiting uh, um, people who are at risk for kidney disease, obtaining environmental samples, bio samples, creating a bio repository. And it's our hope that as we observe people developing disease, we will be able to evaluate antecedent exposures in, in a set of cases and matched controls, really take a deep dive into potential, a broad range of potential environmental or, or genetic causes. The NIH is planning this on a broader scale um, through the CURE Consortium, and we're lucky to be um, part of that consortium as well here at Stanford. So you may be wondering why we're discussing a kidney disease in Sri Lanka and Nicaragua when our talk is entitled End-Stage Kidney Disease in the Central Valley. Um, so there are two obvious parallels. It, there is a lot of agricultural work in California Central Valley. It is hot and dry, but the question really is, is there also a high burden of kidney disease? And this figure really answers that question. Um, this was ma a map generated by the US RDS, US Renal Data System, which hosts all the data of um, patients undergoing dialysis in the US. So it's an excellent data repository. And here, what they're mapping is incident and stage kidney disease between 2014 and 2018. Um, and the darker blue represents higher incidence. And so you can clearly see that um, the California Central Valley as a contiguous region has amongst the highest incidence of end-stage kidney disease in the US. 
And we further evaluated this question of, um, of the, we further evaluated the incidence of, the high incidence of end-stage kidney disease in Central Valley by really honing in on people who were younger and honing in on people who would have what we called unexplained end-stage kidney disease. So the cause of end-stage kidney disease in the USRDS was defined either as unknown tubular interstitial nephritis or attributed to hypertension. And people may have questions about that and I'm happy to answer those in, in the Q&A. But when we really looked at these people, we wanted to find out where do they live in California? And so we mapped them geographically, and then we used geospatial analysis to really identify clusters of unexplained end-stage kidney disease. So these blue arrows are pointing to green lines, which are the clusters that we identified using our GIS analysis. So essentially, within these clusters, the proportion of patients who are classified as unexplained is higher than the neighboring areas. And then we layered these clusters on top of groundwater nitrates. And what we were using ground on, groundwater nitrate to be a proxy for agricultural work. And so you can see visually, and we also found that 85% of people um, living in these hotspots of uh, end-stage kidney disease were um, living in um, areas with high agricultural activity. And so this really showed that younger people with end-stage kidney disease that was unexplained were more likely living in areas of high agricultural activity in California. So I'm going to pass the mic over to Dr. Contreras Nevis, who's going to describe our pilot but, and explain how we're taking this work forward. But I really wanted to, before I do that, I really wanted to point out how cool it is that investigating CKDU globally is really broadening our perspective of cause of kidney disease and kidney disease as a whole in, in, uh, in our field. But it's also inspiring curiosity and a renewed look at kidney disease in our own backyard. Thank you so much, Dr. Anand. Such a pleasure to be with all of you today. And I will be talking about a project. So first I want to start with the aims of a project, which I divided into three. The first one that I have is that we want to evaluate the occupational and residential histories of the patients undergoing dialysis in California Central Valley. And the second aim goes along with the first aim, which is about linking these residential and occupational histories to publicly available state water and pesticide use data in order to quantify environmental exposure of patients undergoing dialysis in California Central Valley. And our last aim is that we want to determine the access to healthcare of patients undergoing dialysis in California Central Valley. And all of this with the eventual goal to see if we can identify any possible risk factors associated with the development of the KBU. So that's why we created this study, case control study, which we define the cases as 18 to 60 years old patients with unexplained end stage kidney disease. And by that I mean either labeled as unknown, attributed to hypertension or intertitial nephritis. And then all controls are 18 to 60 years old patients that are sex match and have a known cause of end stage kidney disease, such as diabetes, glomerular diseases, polykemic disease. And then our plan is to recruit 370 patients that are cases and 370 patients that are uh, controls. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. You can. There's a little bit of background um, noise. If there's any way to um, eliminate that, that'd be great. But otherwise, continue. Okay, I'll, I'll try to speak louder. Yeah. There's some construction work behind me. No all problem. Right. All right, and that's why we created our questionnaire, which we call the Dialysis Occupational and Environmental uh, Health Questionnaire, which we basically adapted questions from previously validated or CDC indoor questionnaire, such as the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, the agricultural health study, among others. And basically what we did is that we created a questionnaire that is divided into three sections. 
And the first section is about the residence and occupational history of these patients, where we ask the patients about where they have lived in their lifetime inside or outside of the United States, and also where they have worked inside or outside of the United States with a focus on agricultural activity. And then we ask them about agricultural activity, specifically their exposures that they have had, such as pesticide exposures, where they, have, where they use their water from, et cetera. And then the other two sections are about healthcare access and also about how their health has been just before they're developing and such kidney disease. And the expectation was that patients are getting their, di their dialysis and then an interviewer go reach them, consent them, and then they do the interview. And what we want to do is that take that data and link it to publicly available data from California on groundwater and environmental contaminants to create an average or cumulative patient exposure. And this right here is just some examples about uh, where we can find this data online. We have here the California Department of Pesticide Regulation, and here on the right, the California Water Boards. So we, uh, this is our study site for our pilot, or the Davida Soledad Dialysis Center. Uh, the medical director, Dr. Krishna Kopal, uh, was so generous to let us use this site. And this is all the wonderful staff that have been helping us. And I want to mention, as Dr. Anand uh, was mentioning before, we were only recently able to begin this work after COVID-19 restrictions were recently uh, released this spring. So that's why we have been only able to uh, complete 17 interviews so far, but we have planned to keep going with this. And in this specific dialysis unit, we have 44 patients that are eligible for this study. And the age of these patients have been between 18 to 59 years old, and the 88% identified themselves as Latino. And as you can see here, most of them are male, are men, 77%. And the cause of end-stage kidney disease in 18% has been labeled as unknown. And 59%, which is the majority of our patients interviewed so far, have been attributed to diabetes. And here, uh, important point is that 82% of the patients have done some kind of agricultural work. This is all more data uh, from our pilot. So in terms of education, 41% had less than nine grades, 12% didn't go to school. In terms of health insurance, we found out that 71% had some interruptions. And then in terms of primary water source here, I won't go much into detail, but I want you to see that 53% uh, use packaged water as their primary water source. And you can see here the rest of the distribution between well water, pipe water, and delivered water. So here in these two maps, uh, I want to point out the first, the first one is about where patient mentioned that they have lived in their lifetime inside the United States. And here, uh, there was one patient that mentioned that he lived in Michigan at some point in his life. So, but besides that patient, all, all the patients mentioned California, which is an interesting point. And then here on the right, you can see a, a map of where patient has lived outside of the United States. And as you can see, it has only been Mexico so far, patients, uh, reported a 59% of the patient interview have lived uh, outside the US. And then from that 59% for, for 59%, have mentioned that they have done some kind of agricultural work. So we have learned uh, many lessons for, from this study. First, many of the patients were unable to answer the questionnaire without the help of an interviewer. So there's many possible factors that could be related to this. One of that can be educational level. Also, we try to simplify the language as much as we could. Language is another barrier. Um, and then the other issue that has been that we also have been trying to do telephone interviews. Uh, but as you can imagine, also that can become a challenge too because in order to reach them eventually when they're on their home, uh, sometimes the time doesn't fit with their time. So that's another barrier we have to work on. 80% uh, or more are Spanish-speaking only patients. 
So uh, that's another challenge in the sense that we need more interviewers uh, that speak Spanish in order to conduct the interviews. But even with these two main challenges, uh, it has been very good that there's a high interest, a high engagement from recruited patients and the staff involved in the project. So that's definitely gonna help a lot in moving this project forward. So as the next steps, we want to complete our payload data collection at the Vida Soledad. Uh, we want to parallel linking this residential data to the publicly available environmental data, as I was mentioning before, in order to create a time average and or cumulative patient exposure. And finally, we want to expand the scope with additional grant resources. Uh, we want to recruit patients from other dialysis units in California Central Valley. And so far, we have been able to have agreements with other medical directors to do that. And finally, uh, engage more Spanish speaking interviewers. So I want to finish saying thank you to all of these wonderful people here uh, who have made this effort possible. We have, uh, I want to thank the Department of Medicine, the Division of Nephrology. Here, special thanks to Dr. Krishna Gopal, who has been so supportive in this project. And here is all the rest of the people that have been so wonderful and, and very supportive through all this process. So thank you all. And I'll open the forum to any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for those amazing talks and congratulations again on your awards. Well-deserved and you're doing some amazing work The both of you or all three of you, I should say, and your teams. Um, it, oh, and one question for Dr. Rodriguez, and we will have some questions coming up. Um, you know, you mentioned that there was this, you mentioned the group of patients um, where a statin wasn't mentioned in the notes. And what I noticed about that data was that there was a huge proportion of patients where, um, where statin, excuse me, wasn't mentioned as opposed to ones where it was mentioned and then they were non-inherent. But it, are we doing anything to address those where it, wasn't mentioned where it probably should have been because that seemed like a lot of patients. Yeah, that's a great question. So only only 18% of those that were not taking statins had any mention of statins. So some people so that suggests again like you know people are coding these diagnoses and my hypothesis is that they're probably deferring to somebody else or people may not say I want to take this on. Um, we gave a lot we were trying to be very generous and saying these are outpatient visits or coding this but you could imagine that there's there may be so many other competing demands. Um, and that could potentially be an intervention or a solution, right? So if you have somebody with an ASCVD diagnosis, automatically it's like, should they be on a stat? And then if not, you didn't kind of have to pick why not. The issue with that is that there's so many competing um, demands on, on especially primary care doctor's time that we, we want to definitely do that for our high risk patients first and then kind of trickle down. Yes, and thank you. And um, I'll... Alan Ringhold also asks, should statins be available over the counter? That's a that's a great question. There's some active uh, Twitter debates on that. I mean, and I have some nephro my nephrology colleagues here. I would say statins are safer than NSAIDs, <laughs> and NSAIDs are over the counter. Um, so, in my opinion, yes, of course. You know, this is what what we do is we prevent cardiovascular disease. Um, there's value to having prescriptions so you could track adherence. And especially with a daily medication, there's a value to having that tracked and LDL measured and things like that. But absolutely, I think uh, a few people uh, would have issues with the statin. Okay, thank you. Dr. Anand, um, one of the things that comes up when people are talking about you know, agricultural workers that automatically, it seems that it must be secondary to dehydration and, and heat. And it seems that it's a little more complicated than that. Can you speak a little bit more to that fact, please? Dr. Golden would like to know. Yeah, I mean, I think that is, it is a valid hypothesis. It's difficult to prove that it's only heat, that it, heat is not an accelerator, but rather the definitive cause. I think partly because of what we know about renal physiology, the kidney is a very salt sensitive organ. So when it is under stress, it really will do its best to hold on to salt. And so the fact that there is certainly heat stress that the, uh, that the 
workers are experiencing, but is it an accelerator of their of a, a second insult or a primary insult versus a um, the primary insult? That's really the debate in our field, um, and. What the evidence currently is, is across a single harvest, we don't know whether that carries forward to long-term development of kidney disease, partly because follow-up has been really challenging in, in some of these areas where people will work for a season and then dissipate into their community and may or may not return for further follow-up to understand what their kidney function is like. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Harrington, who has a few questions for our presenters. So uh, thank you, Dr. Dunn. These were really three terrific talks and uh, great use of uh, in exactly what we intended when we established the uh, the, the diversity uh, awards for, for research and really pointing out the importance of doing this kind of research. And the three of you have used those resources uh, in, in a really great fashion. So thank you all. Uh, Fatima, my first question is for you. You know, I, I remain stunned that sort of 35 years into the statin experience that we still see these gaps. And uh, so I applaud you for continuing to poke away. Uh, but I'm going to ask you sort of the broad ex existential question, and then I'm going to ask you a specific question. Why is that? I mean, it, it almost seems ridiculous. I mean, are we as doctors like that unknowing about something that has been available for 35 years? That's, that's my sort of existential question. My specific question about your work is, um, as you know, there's a lot of work on physician-patient concordance and the building of trust and those sorts of things. Uh, the gender differences are striking. Some of the racial and ethnic minority data are striking. Um, do you have the data within our system to be able to do physician, or let me rephrase it, clinician, um, patient concordance and where that plays into this? So of course, great questions. And, and you know, I, I don't have the answer or the existential answer of, of why we have this issue with statins, but there's interesting that um, one of my colleagues, Anne-Marie Navarre, will give a talk about statin misinformation and vaccine hesitancy. It's kind of the same thing. So statins have a, a, such bad press and, and there's actually a great population-based study out of Denmark that shows that when there's bad press, that an adherence goes down and myocardial infarctions go up. You know, it's an ecological study. But this is really one of the safest medications that we have. It's generic. Um, what what I thought the focus group data again uh, before this project or preliminary data, it's it's we've made cholesterol too complicated, right? We've said, you know, your HDL is good. This number is good. This we want to kind of keep things simple. Statins reduce LDL, but they're also risk reducers for, for these high-risk populations, and we, we have to keep things simple. And again, measuring LDL, I think, is still important, but very few people, without exception, that have ASCVD should be on a statin. And I always start all the projects with the highest risk groups where there's really no controversy. Then there's probably FH patients, of course, um, diabetes, diabetics, and then and then the high-risk primary prevention where there, where there could be a little bit more nuances. So that's for that question. The concordance between uh, the clinician and the patient is a really important one. So for the focus groups that I presented some of the patient data, we actually did those focus groups with the clinicians as well. And these were the clinicians that had primarily underserved populations that worked all over the United States. Um, and we did kind of address some of those cultural aspects when the clinician spoke the same language, uh, there were fewer barriers at least to, to taking the medication. Uh, prescribing the medication, but we also they also had confusion within the clinicians themselves. They're like, the guidelines are changing too quickly. I didn't realize I was supposed to put the patient on a statin. Um, the LDL seemed good. The HDL was was okay. The ratio. How about their triglycerides? So I think things have changed, and we have to simplify the messaging. Uh, at Stanford, I haven't seen the data, but if that data is available, I would we would love to to evaluate that. So I think we'll we'll take that offline to try to answer that. Terrific. And, and uh, my, my next question is for Suchi and team. Um, Suchi, I'm interested, it, when you started out framing the problem, you talked about deaths amongst young men. And I have a two-part question here. I'm curious as to what they died of. Did they die because of lack of availability of dialysis? I don't think of people necessarily dying from end-stage renal disease because we have ways to at least delay it. And so I'm curious as to what they died of. And that gets to my next question. Have there been autopsy studies to look at other end organs like the heart, like the brain, 
Um, are there things building up in the in the heart, for example, heavy metals, et cetera, uh, that could be related to things like arrhythmias, et cetera? Yeah, so they are they are dying of kidney disease. Um, and you're right, it's mostly related to access um, to dialysis therapy. Um, also the burden on family, because it's it's in Sri Lanka, for example, where the government has provided more. Um, provisions for renal replacement therapy, whether that be peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis. The change in the role from being a breadwinner to being someone who is sick and not able to care for their family has been really devastating for the for some of the affected populations. And they opt to not pursue dialysis or they opt to, to you know, withdraw after some time of therapy um, because of, of the, the perceived burden. Um, and so that they're they're dying of kidney disease. The question about autopsies is a very good question. Um, it's been raised again and again because that is one way that we can get time averaged exposures and also understand other end organ damage. Um, and bone, for example, is a really good reservoir for lead. And so it'd be really great to have bone tissue or liver tissue to understand some of the time. Uh, average exposures is just not available as and it's not culturally accepted. So some of this is a negotiation of, with the research infrastructure as well as with the cultural uh, uh, you know acceptability and engagement in the population and that hasn't been able to be successfully implemented. Thank you for uh, for that very helpful. Great, thank you so much. And uh, moving along there's a few there are a few more questions. Um, Tim Gaddis would like to know if the agricultural worker population in Hawaii has been considered to be included in a study for, for kidney disease. I think it's a great question. I think agricultural workers uh, in in uh, many areas, you know, if you think about Africa, you know, that's also there are other places in the world that would fit the descriptions of the geographic hotspots. And I think it'd be great to have more resources devoted to studying kidney health in agricultural populations worldwide. We just, it's not been, um, it's not been pursued as much as we'd like to, and we'd like to change that by starting with, with California. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Nan. And um, Dr. Manali Patel, um, she makes a comment here that there are many systems and level level systems level issues with why certain populations don't receive evidence based care across multiple conditions, and she wonders if there are some built in mechanisms such as electronic prompts in the EHR that could make it such that there are not these discrepancies in discrepancies in delivery of evidence based care when indicated. Um, Kaiser has done something similar for CRC screening and reduced their racial and ethnic disparities in screening. Absolutely. And I think that there's different solutions or will work for different populations and you have to do all three. So you have to target the patient, the clinician, I think the health system, a closed system like Kaiser, like the VA, um, those kind of, of tools, decision support tools, reminders can be helpful. Although I will say that in the statin adherence literature, a few of these programs have had lasting su success, even in cardiology practices. And some of the reason is that they don't consider the user design when they're designing them. They think this is a good idea. And there's so many other things going on in the clinical counter that's not a priority. Um, there's the population health interventions that are outside of the physician's office, I think are, are the most promising. And there's some work being done with that about really risk factor control, not just cholesterol, but whole cardiometabolic health. And again, this is unlike screening for a disease, this is gonna be a lifelong therapy, potentially a daily medication. So you can't just say it's prescribed, set it and forget it. You have to follow people and make sure that adherence is being tracked like a, like a vital sign. Okay, thank you. And um, Rex Jameson asks about leptospirosis being, being such a rare disease, how many patients with this renal disease have been shown to have it? That's a great question, Dr. Jameson. Um, thank you. And uh, you know, in the hotspots, in the geographic hotspots in Mesoamerica and in Sri Lanka, it's not as rare actually leptospirosis. Um, there have been case control studies where they have looked at serology um, and so shown that about 25% of people, like it's a, it's prevalent in the population, 25% of patients have or people recruited in these studies have 
uh, evidence of leptospirosis by serology, but there haven't been differences detected between cases and controls. And so it's not clear if it's, a, if it's a, a different type of infection or a newer strain of leptospirosis, um, that those, those still remain open, open questions. Great, thank you, Dr. Han. It's actually, it's nine o'clock right now. If we have time for one more question um, from Irene Shaw, I would love to do that. Um, and she asks about um, studies that look at time allowed between providers and, and patients um, on the impact of statin adherence, given that you know, there are time constraints when you need to address concerns by the patient and discussing risk benefit ratios. So that's a great question. I haven't seen specifically around the time of the visits, but what I have seen is that the non-clinician uh, interventions can be more effective. So things like using community health workers, pharmacists, so kind of leaving outside of the healthcare encounter so that you could use that time for something else. Okay, with that, we have had a wonderful grand rounds, Dr. Anand, Dr. Rodriguez, Dr. Nieves. It was a pleasure having all of you. Congratulations again on these spectacular projects and for receiving the inaugural chief um, divest, uh, excuse me, chair divest, <laughs> invest, <laughs> diversity awards. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Of course. Have a great day, everyone. See you next week.